How's it going? It's Travis Mortz with the Forest Hill Film Lab. Uh, today I wanted to make a video about exposure. Um, I already made a video talking about the Sunny 16 rule, but I was thinking that although I explain how to get correct exposure outdoors and how to read light, I never really explain what exposure is and what makes an exposure and uh, what kinds of things go into making exposure more in depth. So. Uh, today I wanted to talk more about that with you guys and really try to geek out on uh, exposure and make it completely understandable to anybody who even understands it a little bit to not at all. Um, we're going to try to break it down completely um, so anybody could enjoy this video hopefully. So today I wanted to explain in depth a little bit more um, what is a, a perfect exposure, how do you make a perfect exposure and what's what's really happening inside of our camera because for me personally once I once I fully understood what my camera was doing every single time I pressed the shutter photography became infinitely easier because everything began to make sense so every time I hear about somebody who wants to start shooting film they say oh I'm probably gonna get so many unexposed shots oh they're probably gonna be so dark and all this stuff and this is just not true. There's no reason on earth that anybody should be able to shoot a roll of film in daylight and not get images. There's just absolutely no reason why. And today I'm going to explain to you guys why it is so simple. Um, exposure is a very easy thing to understand, but it has to be explained to you because the word aperture and f-stop and shutter speed and ISO, these things mean nothing to anybody if they don't learn what they mean. So for me, when I heard f-stops, I would have no idea what an f-stop was unless somebody explained to me what the hell an f-stop was. So here is me explaining to you guys what the hell an f-stop is and also explaining to you what these f-stops are doing. So um, a while back in a book, I read this, um, this great analogy explaining exposure. So uh, here we have an empty cup. And we're going to pretend that this jar here is our faucet. I, I don't have a faucet right here. I want to show you guys up close, but we'll say it's a faucet. So if I turn the faucet on at full blast, it'll take me, we'll say it's going to take a second to fill this cup. So full blast, faucet, one second. So now that is the equivalent of our open aperture, wide open aperture. Here's our lens. We got it wide open wide open aperture at one second is going to create a perfect exposure. Pretty, pretty easy to understand. Our water represents the light. Our glass represents our film, you know, the correct amount of light to accommodate our image. And uh, here we go. We're going to pour it back in here. So now if it takes me one second to fill it up wide open. Then if I stop down one stop, we're going to go down one stop. Here we go just like this. That's one stop. And one stop is half as much light. It doesn't seem like that's that, that's accurate, but one stop is half as much light. So that means my full blast is now going to turn into half blast, if you will. So what's going to happen? If I pour it half as fast as I did, it takes twice as long. So now our exposure just changed from 2.8 at one second to f4 at two seconds, uh, and so on and so forth. So if we if we went up to f5.6, it would go to four seconds because we would then go half again, and this this is how exposure works. Um, now the ever so elusive question is, what about ISO? ISO is what indicates our film speed, how much light our film needs to make this correct exposure. Uh, we'll say this is 100 ISO, this glass here. This is a lot of light, right? Well, this glass right here would indicate, you know, uh, 800 ISO, if you will. So it's going to be full blast at, well, oh, half a second. And here we still have our full exposure, but our duration is less, our aperture is less, and our outcome is the same. So, you know, to make a full, perfect exposure, we need a full glass of water regardless of the size of our cup. The size of our cup indicates our ISO. The speed at which we pour it indicates our aperture and how long we have to pour it indicates our shutter speed. So now that we've got that example out of the way and we kind of understand that 
you know, in this example, water represents light. Um, I wanted to show you guys with actual, you know, settings and actual photography numbers what all of this stuff is really doing. Now that we understand that our full glass of water equals a correct exposure, let's talk about some of the photography things that uh, make the correct exposure. So, here we have a uh, shutter speed. These are all the shutter speeds, and if you look where it starts, it starts at one second. And from one second, it turns into a fraction, and this is what we see our shutter speeds. Our shutter speeds are all fractions of a second. So from one second, it goes to half a second. Now, as we explained earlier, all things are either twice as much or half as much in photography. So here from one second to a half a second is obviously half as much time. And from there on, it's going to go to a quarter second, to an eighth of a second, and so on and so forth. Therefore meaning that with every setting we choose, we're getting half as much light, half as much time, half as much light. Uh, therefore, when we open up our shutter speed from one half of a second to one second, we're getting twice as much light. Now, in the uh, you know in the higher numbers, it doesn't seem like that would be such a big deal, but even from 500th of a second to 250th of a second, it's still twice as much light. It's still one full stop, which equals twice as much light. Now, here we have apertures. And with these aperture settings, they are exactly the same as the shutter speeds. Now, of course, the numbers are different, and they're, these are uh, fractions as well. Um, but these numbers correspond with one stop of light per click. So from 1.4 to F2, which uh, is one stop, that's going to be half as much light. So here's, this is 5.6 to F8, but no different. It's still one stop. Here's 5.6 that's F8 and from there to here is twice as much light or half as much light um, and here we go I've got I grabbed this shutter so we could really see the difference so here we've got one second let's see it one more time one second we go one click half as much light it makes you know it makes a ton of sense with the slower shutter speeds but like I said it, it, it stays true throughout of uh, all the shutter speeds as well as all of the apertures. Now here we'll open this up and we can see our aperture blades closing. Here's one stop, two stops, three stops, and so on and so forth. So uh, that leaves us with ISO. ISO is our film's sensitivity to light and this as well goes in the same exact increments. Half as much or twice as much. So from 100 ISO to 200 ISO is twice as sensitive. From 200 to 400 is twice again. And 400 to 800 is twice again. So what that means for us is that 800 ISO is a lot more sensitive than 100 ISO. And also, with every ISO we add, we gain settings. So if our, if our exposure, here's a Sunny 16 exposure, for instance. 100 ISO at 1 25th of a second, F16, that is a sunny day outside. If we increase our ISO to 800, then we could then increase our shutter speed to 800 or 1000 would be the closest corresponding shutter speed. And we would get an equivalent exposure because, you know, every action has an opposite and equal reaction, especially with photography. So... If we're here at 1 15th of a second at f4 and we stop down to 5 6, we're going to be letting less light in, therefore needing more time. We just go one stop in each direction and it works out the same. So um, when it comes to our ISO in film, ISO is not a variable, so that's kind of nice. We get to choose that when we put our film in. 100 ISO is then what we have to work with. We have our glass here of 100 ISO to work with and this is how much light we need to fill that 100 ISO. There's there's a, a thousand different formulas to get this amount of light but it's whichever one you choose for your image. You choose one and decide the other. So um, I think that this is a pretty good breakdown of exposure. Like I said it's a little bit tricky when you hear f-stop and shutter speed and ISO and all these things but all you really need to know is that they all do the same job. They all let in half as much light or twice as much light. So every stop in every aspect of photography is exactly the same. A stop in shutter is equal to a stop in aperture is equal to a stop in ISO. So 
Because of that, we have the ability to make equivalent exposures based on one shutter speed, one aperture, and one ISO. We can figure out equivalent exposures for all settings. You know, if I have, uh, you know, if this is my exposure, like I said, and I decided that I wanted to shoot at f8, well, we would start at f16 and we would go one stop, two stops to f8. And we would then have to add two stops of shutter speed to make up for the difference. So we would start at 125, one stop, two stops. Our new exposure would be F8 at 500th of a second. Same ISO, same exposure, no different. We just have different settings, different uh, formula to make the same damn thing. So um, anyways, that was a little bit long-winded. So I'm going to move on from this and talk to you guys a little bit about... Um, I guess metering and what your meter's doing when you're when you're out there trying to find the right exposure. So now that we've learned exactly what it takes to make an image, um, you know, it takes light, of course it takes light, but it takes a certain amount of light for a certain amount of time with a certain amount of film sensitivity, and that's how we make our perfect image. So um, say we've got our perfect image in mind, and we want to achieve that perfect image, and we're not reading light just by out going outside and looking at it we're using a camera so um, you point your camera at a scene and it gives you an exposure well what is your camera actually seeing your camera does not see the green trees and your camera does not see the blue sky and it does not see the person's skin tone that's reflecting more light than everything else your camera only sees gray um, now what I mean by that is uh, let's grab this out of here what this is, is a neutral gray card. This, uh, this gray card right here corresponds to zone 5 in the zone system, which is the absolute center of the scale for um, tones. This is middle gray. This, the, the middle, of the, middle of the road gray. It's not black, it's not white. And this is what your camera sees. This is what your meter sees. This is what your camera is telling you how to expose things. So um, if I point my camera at this black desk, my meter is going to tell me how to make this black desk gray. And if I go outside and I point my camera at snow, my meter is going to tell me how to make that white snow gray. This is what our camera tells us how to do. Our camera tells us exactly how to make what we're pointing at middle gray. Because it assumes that you're pointing at something that should be middle gray. And therefore, all of the highlights in your scene will be highlighted, and all of the shadows or you know, darkness in your scene will be shadows or darkness. Um, the reason that this is an issue, the, the reason that you guys need to know this is because some situations, like I mentioned, uh, you don't want your meter doing that. And you would like to know what your camera is actually doing. Um, you know, when you line up that, when you line up the, the needle in the center or whatever your metering system is, what you're doing is you're setting your exposure perfectly for your whole entire scene to be gray, which is awesome. Um, unless you don't want that. So if you're inside of a church building and there's bright windows, your cameras are going to see those bright windows and it's going to make those bright white windows gray and it's going to make the whole entire exposure inside of the church incorrect. So basically, the reason I'm telling you guys this is to be aware. Be aware that your meter is, um, it is your friend, but know what it's doing. It is setting your, your, your exposure to be middle gray. Um, I'm going to pull open this book, actually, so we can see exactly what the hell I'm talking about. Um, here we go. Beautiful, beautiful. So here we've got an example of um, the zone system. And the zone system is what Ansel Adams is most known for in, you know, in the photography world. He is the, the godfather of the zone system. He invented it. He taught us all about it. Uh, as you can see, this gray card is middle gray. There's our number five. It's supposed to be right here. And these are all the tones of photography. These are This is what our film can handle. So if we have middle gray, every one of these shades is one stop of light. This is what our aperture is doing. It's taking our gray, and every click we make, it's making it a little bit closer to black or a little bit closer to white. These are all apertures. So the reason that I'm telling you guys this is if you are outside in the white snow and you point your meter and it tells you 125 F16 at 100 ISO, it's telling you how to make that snow gray. 
And if you want that snow to be up here in the white zone, maybe a zone eight, you're gonna need to give it two stops. One, two, you know, two stops. So basically, know your meter and know what your meter's metering. Uh, let's take another look at some of these other examples they have. You see, this is a perfect example. You see how dark this image is? If we were to meter with our on-camera meter in this scene, this whole image would be completely blown out because it would expose this to be gray rather than exposing this to be the black that the photographer decided. So um, this is an extremely good example of why following your camera's meter isn't always the best choice and why understanding exposure is so important. Um, in my Sunny 16 video, I, I stressed the fact that if you don't know what your exposure should be, then you'll never know if your exposure is incorrect or wrong. If you're inside of a building and you have wonky exposure, you, you won't know it because you don't know what it should be. So uh, I just wanted to show you guys these examples. See here we've got another scene where, um, you know, if we, if we just relied on our light meter, this image would be completely different because of the lighting situation that we found ourselves in. Um, here's another great example of the difference. See here? Uh, the buildings were metered in this image, and now we've got sharpness in the buildings and, uh, you know, darkness in the foreground. And then on this one, the foreground is what was metered, and now the foreground is middle gray, and the background is completely washed out. Um, and these are two completely different images, and it would be a shame if this is the only one you had because you followed what your meter said and then moved on. Um, it's always kind of nice to have some educated guess as far as, you know, what you want and how to achieve what you want. Um, and more often than not, achieving what you want is going to be done by your own accord and not so much following a meter or following your digital screen on the back. It's mostly what you want it to be. So um, those are just a couple examples I wanted to show you guys. There's a real old book, so it kind of covers all the basics like that. Um, and the, this neutral gray card is a great thing because you could, um, you could actually bring this out into the light and you can meter off of this because we know this is neutral gray. And then that could give us a perfect exposure in an uh, ambient setting because we could decide, hey, this is neutral gray. And I have my light here. And if I make this neutral gray, then all my whites will be white and all my blacks will be black based on this exact lighting. And that, that's the reason for having a neutral gray card. So now that I've kind of explained what your, uh, what your exposure meter is doing inside of your camera and, and you know, really how it works, um, I guess I'll just leave you guys with one last bit of advice for, for you guys out there trying to figure out exposure or trying to figure out how to manually expose your film. Um, it is a little more difficult when you don't have a screen on the back telling you if you're doing a great job or not. So um, I understand the apprehension. Um, so this little piece of advice I'm going to give you guys is um, we're going to look back at our chart. So when you put a roll of film in your camera, it's a certain ISO. So that is no longer a variable. So I usually shoot 100. We put 100 ISO film in. So now we're left with two variables in order to find our exposure. So my, my last piece of advice to you guys is choose one first. Pick one first and then choose the other. So. What I mean by that is if you if you're going outside and you have a hundred ISO film which you now lo no longer can change and you want to take an image choose one setting to work with so decide to yourself um, I want to shoot this image at f8 because I like the amount of depth of field at f8 choose f8 and set f8 on your camera and then all you have to worry about is what your shutter is going to be for that given aperture. Now you're not left trying to figure out what, what to do because, like I mentioned earlier, every action has an opposite reaction. So if you're changing both of these settings simultaneously, you're really shooting yourself in the foot. You're not doing yourself any favors. You're just moving one step away from the right equation every single time you do that. So in the future, when you're out there shooting, decide one and then pick the other corresponding setting to make your right exposure. Me personally, I like shooting action. So sometimes I'll be out there and I'll decide I have to have a 500th of a second. So 500th of a second is my criteria. I've got 100 ISO. Now I only have one variable left. And if it's sunny 16 outside, my aperture is going to be f8. And now, now it's f8. So if I choose that it's f11 or I accidentally choose 5.6, I'm only one stop off in each direction. 
and that's completely work withable. You could you could save one stop in each direction. So now I really have a three stop window of success, realistically. So um, you know, take that for what it's worth. That's how I do things personally. I choose one and set the other. Um, typically, I choose my shutter speed first, and I change my aperture as the light changes, and it's pretty foolproof. So, uh, anyways. I hope you guys really enjoyed this video. Uh, I've been wanting to talk about exposure for a little while. Uh, as you can tell, I've got a whole lot to say about it. So if you guys made it this far, I really appreciate you guys watching. And uh, until next time, thank you guys for watching and keep on shooting.